Yeah, at least my coffee mug's on theme. Right? That's true, you have microdose on there. Yeah, at least my coffee mug's on theme. Right? That's true, you have microdose on there. I don't have tip cap though. You, you don't have? No, oh, I do. You do. Are we allowed to plug him? Fuck yeah, he's a man. Brand? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only big brands. Only big brands. They're brands that might sue us for otherwise, <laughs> you know, participating. Mm. All right, cool. What are we talking about today? So, today we're just going to be talking about flow hoods, filters, all different sizes, types, um, different instances that we might need them, and just kind of general setups, applications and where we might find these filters. Yeah, regardless of uh, how um, accessible they are now, they're not all created equally. And there seems to be an abundance of people now getting into these FFU units. And I think the, um, where is this? It's a fan filter unit, I guess. That's mm -hmm. why it's called that, right? It's got a fan in it. Sure, I yeah. was gonna ask you before we started what FFU meant. I think I it's fan filter it, unit. But, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fan I, that's just what I've called them forever. But they're traditionally used uh, in labs like to be supported by a uh, ceiling. Um, mm -hmm. So you can install them and install them for overhead flow hood and stuff for yeah. positive pressure. But I think that's just because what they've been used for doesn't mean that mushroom people won't just steal shit and kind of make it their own i mean might as well um yeah i mean perfect. all of these i guess we'll just say so like yeah it's this is kind of the basis of every clean room yeah. all mycological work that we see nowadays it's always done in front of these ffus and specifically hepa filtered ffus yeah um as opposed to still air boxes or uh, some other form of uh, light yeah. sawing and then working diligently. Yeah, I've seen fast. people bring up still air boxes and, you know, you could get away with it, but then what is your thing that's pumping in that still yeah. air? You would still need some type of filtration right. unit that's doing that. Um, I was and talking to a uh, grower out in, uh, he's a Cubensis grower out west, and he's saying that, I don't know if you, when you first read like uh, The Cultivator or Growing Gourmet Medicinal, any of the stamina stuff, but there's that image in there of like the sterile white clean closet, and it's like if you can just exist in very small movements and soak the air in Lysol, you can have a still air room. Yeah, it's like the worst example of like a way to go about sterile work you at just all. just open murder <laughs> all the cultures immediately. Yeah. Well, the minute you walk in there, yeah, you're kind yeah. of fucking, you're exuding contains. You're not, yeah, huh. So yeah, that doesn't really seem, so this, this idea then became having a constant push, a constant cycle of this air yeah. in in the mushroom world instead of existing in these kind of stagnant places because yeah. uh, in my world the chemistry world that's perfectly fine yeah we're not working with these biologics we're not worried about contamination we're just worried about some water getting inside of our round bottom flask if the reaction doesn't have water so you yeah. know rinse with acetone plug it and you're good to go mm -hmm. it's not this whole big setup where you're worried about dust and everything obviously you have a fume hood and whatnot that's pulling in this dirty air but none of it's you know getting into your flask yeah so it's very different in terms of requirements yeah uh -huh. for sure yeah and i think it's generally because we're not trying to work with anything but super rich um uh substrates that contaminate really easily specifically yeah it's just free food for yeah. anything out there yeah. yeah and that's what we're propagating this stuff on so it, it requires something of filtration mm -hmm. um i think we're lucky enough to have baker like in uh maine right where the fuck are they they're in uh yeah 207 i think it's scarborough or something like that oh, okay. but baker actually is the one who makes these edge guards mm -hmm. gregor just rebuilt this edge guard by the way uh, we're not going to mention where it came from but it was uh, it, it wasn't was, in the best it was shape. mutilated <laughs> let's just put it that way let's so. just say it um had some disco lights that didn't approve of yeah yeah <laughs> uh, you can't all be fucking wooks here you know mm -hmm. so um but yeah this is a pretty standard size of a flow hood um i think the one we have is an edge guard as well back at the yeah. uh, gardener warehouse yeah uh, i think this one's slightly larger 
do we want to get into Florida? Yeah, let's and let's go from that. like the most expensive insanity down to um, field models and yeah. like at home sort of fucking around stuff. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you just brought this back, so kind of walk us through how this machine works in general. Okay, so this is essentially to establish a permanent workspace within your lab or your clean room where we're just gonna have these HEPA filters always running a very easy to clean surface. It does have wheels, but everyone just keeps them still once they're in place. And here it's just got your outlets, it's got your filtration, your lights so that you can just have a nice big long workstation. You don't have to worry about any contaminants coming in from the outside because we're blowing. So it's just to create this beautiful place to work. And so how it works is underneath in these slats, we do have, I guess, um, could just go open them up. Yeah, what Might do we be need? a little more, uh, just a flathead. They're not like real screws, they're just, um. Yeah, so anyways, underneath these slats, obviously it's just there to have enough airflow so these can still pull and block any huge particles. Then our next layer of protection is we have these pre-filters. These are just basic. We cut these ourselves. You could order pre-measured, pre-cut ones, but it's pretty much just a foam or I guess a cotton sheet, much like cotton paper or cotton swabs or balls that you may see in other types of filtration in like an at-home setup, so to say. And then we just have a grate, just so we're not constantly pulling these into our fan. And then right in here, we have our actual blower. I don't know the type of blower, but they're strong enough to pull in air and be able to shoot it up through the back of the flow hood and out through the HEPA filters at our laminar flow rate, which is 90 feet per minute. And so, yeah, that's pretty basic in how it works. It's just a blower, a box, a pre-filter, and then in the back of the flow hood, there is it's probably a space a maybe about this big of just empty air and it's closed off. And then it's just the back of these filters and it just gets pushed right through. They don't have a pre-filter attached to the back of them like you'll see on this guy where there is an insert for a pre-filter. These are just standard, I guess, HEPO wall filters because we already have our pre-filter setup going on down here. It's another reason too why a lot of people, I don't know why people ask this all the time, but they're like, when can I just shut this off, only run it when I run it? Part of the reason you don't want to do that is because you're pulling in, say this is a dirty lab and we'll get into this in a little bit situation, mm -hmm. but if you're just coming in, in in normal clothes, put on a lab coat and a mask and gloves or something, you're, you know, dirty clothes or human are basically pulling into the filter. So you want to sort of trap them, you know, in that filter and always have that fan running, right? To mm -hmm. just like keep it going. Yeah, because again, it's a filter. So we're currently filtering the air as it's on. Yeah. So when you're coming in, it's actively cleaning the air in case you are releasing all those particles as right. well. Right. And so also in a dirty lab setting where maybe doors open, people are around, it might be nicer where you have it constantly running. So when you come in, you don't have to worry about if you have any samples yeah. or you're gonna bring anything into the flow hood. You don't have to worry about, okay, get in there, turn it on, let it filter for an hour or so just yeah. to ensure that it is a clean, sterile environment and then you can work. Right. So if you are having constant production, yeah. just having it on all the time makes yeah. things a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that makes a ton of sense. Um, <laughs> um these can be brought back like i see these at auctions all the time um and yeah i've seen some really bad ones that look like they were left outside like a motorcycle in a hurricane um yeah this... i mean like i said it was bleach clean millet right. grain everywhere and yeah you know you just have to be thorough constantly yeah. run it make sure that it all gets clean but these hepa filters with proper care will last years and years and years so yeah. the actual replacement of these wall units shouldn't happen for seven plus years i was gonna say like seven years. to ten years almost you can get away with yeah, yeah. And they get more filtered in time which i don't know if this one in particular but i know the one that we have in um gardner 
It has a static pressure reading at the back, so it can it can read the um, sort of back pressure on the filter, and it can control those motors to speed them up automatically, mm -hmm. so that you're actually reaching that 90 feet per second. So or that's a little indicator if yeah. your filters are getting blocked. If that yeah, going up. I think yeah. it's got a meter yeah, it's on got it, the right? actual right top. inches of mercury yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that allows cool. you to know if you have to replace them. Replacing these is like that's like 700 bucks in filter material basically yeah and then the back is just again a couple of screw clamps that just pull yeah, them out pull it out take it out insert another one it's all very it is just like a big shell yeah and you're very easy to just so plug weird. and play so to say yeah 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 and i think that the cost of these units and their like specialty design is extensive and expensive like they range. I, I want to say it's like between, let's say, six thousand and upwards of twenty thousand, depending upon the size and the, yeah. um, you know, complexity of them. I think it just gets a little crazy, yeah. like with the other lab things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go yeah. From thousand to fifty. Yeah, it's right. super weird. So if you find one of these and and it's you know a couple hundred bucks and you don't test the filters and you have to replace them or something, seven hundred bucks is nothing compared to what it could be in that regard, yeah. um, buying one brand new. And then I think there is a point to that as well of, it is, when I say like a shell, it's kind of a closed off unit. Yeah. So the only real thing would be watch out for is if maybe your panels on the side are rusted to the point where they're open. Yeah. And so air's getting able to be pulled in and pushed through that's not getting through our pre-filters and yeah. through that um, first stage. Yeah. Um, then I can imagine that being a yeah, problem to look out for, but. Sure. If it's not got holes in it, I feel like for the most part. Yeah. And then just having the space. Yeah, space is nice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it gives you a lot of space to actually spread out and work and let stuff cool. Mm -hmm. um, also, having sort of these panels on the side is really important. Um, and these units in particular have a grate that allow you to, it kind of like surface pulls back the air on all the surfaces, returns it to the back and the blower down underneath and then recycles it so you have a lot of points of kind of pulling in fresh air to be able to filter mm. uh, i remember when i was out in arizona it's kind of funny but the, i was arguing with this guy who i was trying to explain like why we needed filters and this is before you could just buy these like you know there wasn't a lot of like options mm -hmm. and he was like a fucking hepa filter sucks dude he's like it sucks <laughs> from the filter and blows into his space and I was like, laminar flow means you push through the filter and it comes out nice and even. And he just like couldn't rationalize it. It's not how air works. Right, but I've <laughs> seen a lot of people with, uh, with this sort of like complex in their head and I'll see it set up too because shop vacs essentially operate the same way. Mm -hmm. A shop vac can be HEPA filtered. Yeah. You, know, you can yeah, yeah. pull in HEPA filtration and just blow it into a room clean. So I'll see people who hook up HEPA filtered shop vacs to their like cool down on their like, you know, uh, steam box. that while they're going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it fucking contaminates everything. Uh, yeah. You know? huh. uh, it's not as good of a seal. And uh, pushing through a filter and creating gaskets all around is really like what we're after. Most of the people watching this, you probably know that. But mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning that uh, some people just don't have that initially. They're like, oh, this is actually forcing air through a filter for a very particular purpose and it's yeah. to have a clean laminar work surface. I think that does say to the size of the motors that yeah. are underneath. And it's a pretty big hefty thing so it's able just to have this constant right. push. Um, and just yeah, have that nice laminar flow where it's just even, always constant pressure, not having like any little pockets where it may swirl around or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I think also we should just mention this is a horizontal flow hood. Mm -hmm. So we have our wall of HEPA filters, and this is just always pushing the air nice and in horizontal lines outwards. And then as Eric mentioned, this little blowback, so it's coming, and then some of that air is just gonna get caught and then pushed right through the whole system again. And for mycological work and all types of work where we really wanna protect the organism that we're working with, a horizontal flow hood is your go-to as compared to a vertical flow hood where the air is constantly coming down from the top and pushing all those particles down. Yeah. So 
the advantage of this, if we're not worried about whatever we're working with hurting us, it's always blowing that air towards us. So if we're just right here in front, there's really no chance of particles falling down because this is constantly pushing out. And it's just that nice constant airflow over. Yeah. And so this 90 feet per minute idea comes into play because if we exceed that amount by too much, the air itself with the grate especially will start to create turbulence and you'll actually get these types of swirls inside of your flow hood. Whereas if we're kind of in this 90 feet per minute zone, it comes out nice and even and the air itself won't mess with each other, so to say. It'll only be your own intrusions. And then if we went too low, where we're still getting a nice even flow, but say we're down at maybe 70 feet per minute, then any particles that come off of you, instead of maybe falling and just immediately getting pushed, some of these particles could be heavy enough and have the chance of falling on whatever we're working with. Yeah, especially because your hands are getting in between the filter and the thing. The goal is to have yourself be on the outside of whatever object you're inoculating or using and only have the chance for the filtered air to have exposure to whatever that is. Yeah, and then, yeah, compared to our vertical, which kind of protects the user a little more from whatever you're working with as the air would come down and then just flow out of the flow hood. And there you would just have to be very careful because if you can imagine you just have your open plate here and then if you're constantly coming and dropping your hand directly over that plate instead of having this good slanted technique you're just going to be constantly blowing those particles down so in a vertical flow hood it could even make more sense to have your tyvek suit on because then you'll just reduce the chance of any hair or skin flakes coming off yeah. obviously along with gloves um but gloves are pretty standard across all this types yeah. of use yeah, it's also, a, there's so many cases to be made for using a vertical, the top-down flow hood, but I think when it comes down to most of the games we play in this sort of, you know, um, sector of making mushrooms grow, this is just so commonplace. And, like, I'll, I'm seeing more and more of vertical flow hoods where they come down mm -hmm. from the top. It's not a bad thing, but I think you can use it for a lot of automated systems. There's a lot of opportunities to using a system like that. Mm -hmm. And China makes the living shit out of them. So they're, they're a lot cheaper. Yeah, maybe yeah. 3000 bucks a unit. Um, you can just buy a tabletop bigger. one that's yeah. maybe like this big for a thousand. Yeah, I've seen. yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and it also depends upon the filter. So the thing to keep in mind, we were just talking about, is how many nines before the seven. <laughs> but you're looking for like a 0 0.3 micron filter. So that's 99.997%. Yeah, so at <laughs> 0.3 micron, that size of diameter, they usually have a rating of 99.95 to 99.97 is right. kind of like the standard. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's there's also, the standard. I know there's different types of filters too. The filter material, different mm -hmm. membranes, different weaves, yeah, different matrices. Yeah, I think matrices. Ulpa, ultra low particle. Yeah. Uh, that one... You might encounter a little more things and just the uh, easy to use yeah. availability of these horizontal flow hoods. Anyone at Cap and Stem that we've trained yeah. doesn't have a micro, micro, oh microbiology degree right. or anything along <laughs> those lines. And we've trained them up perfectly, yeah. never have any issues. So this just allows for that easy to learn, easy to use, instead yeah. of having to go through this kind of rigorous understanding. Yeah, which is super mm -hmm. valuable to a farm owner who's hiring people. If you mm -hmm. hire somebody and they don't know what they're doing and they're using a vertical, flow, yeah. it's gonna end up- Just as long as they work failing. slow and- Yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's huge. Um, cool. Yeah, let's turn it on and let's use this thing. This is a uh, an Emma meter. Um, basically just measures uh, filtration or uh, CFM or, air movement um, and what we're shooting for here is 90 feet per minute <clears throat> and basically that's I haven't coming tested like, this one so yeah so it's coming out 
126. <laughs> yeah, so at the point at which you're like working, which is maybe like what, this is six inches off? Yeah, usually when I'm minutes. working, it's about in this zone. Yeah, so we get about yeah, see, so I've noticed this too, and across pretty much all filters, it's synonymous. The closer you are to the filter, obviously it's gonna it's gonna get crazier, but then towards the middle, <clears throat> it starts to slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different reasons for that, but generally speaking, you wanna shoot if you can adjust your actual uh, fan speed for having about 90 where you're going to be working. Yeah, I haven't messed around with this one, but it does seem like there's a little Variax switch yep. down there that you can change the yeah, voltage so you on them. Can yeah. Alter it, yeah, yeah. So this one would be a bit high. It's cranking out at like one between between ninety and one thirty, and then on this side, got like one twenty nine, and then as you get out closer to the edge, it's gonna drop quite severely. Mm -hmm. And then now we're going down below our point. Yep. Yeah, so as it drops, as it gets closer to the edge, the important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, that's why you want to work as close to the filter as possible. Um, and that really helps to sort of ensure that your work is existing in that 90 feet per minute sort of zone. Mm -hmm. I guess the range I saw was 0.3 to 0.5 meters a second so that's yeah. i think that's about 70 to 90 yep. when uh brought out yeah so these are super useful just in dialing these in <clears throat> um far switch and, yeah and they're not that expensive they the more expensive ones <clears throat> in particular have um more of a like encased um um, fan so it's more accurate across the board so I wouldn't go for <clears throat> the cheapest anemometer out there <clears throat> but I wouldn't go for the most expensive one either <clears throat> and yes Excuse I think me. that just highlighted an important fact of permanent workspace inside of here yep. you know this is your cutoff zone so if you're working with your biologic material it always stays up here yeah we're not gonna bring it out here to show everything because again we've just lost all as exampled all of our nice sterile air and maybe now we're inviting the availability of particles to come into play yep yeah what is the i know this is sort of a tangent off topic but there was some chemist who discovered that um maybe it was somebody as ridiculous as jonathan ott i can't remember but they discovered that uh um um What's in thermometers? Mercury. Mercury. Mercury poisoning isn't necessarily from the liquid, but it's from the gas, and you can't see that gas except for under particular um, observation. I don't know what it is, using like uh, thermal lights or something like that. Yeah, it would just be a different <clears throat> spectra. Right, <clears throat> but it's important to know that like we can't see wind currents in the same way that we can't really like judge you know mercury vapors that are actually existing in a space. Uh -huh. So you kind of have to infer that the way in which this air is coming out of the filters, any movement, if they're fast and diligent, is going to push back you know, and have this like pull in. Mm -hmm. So if you're operating in a dirty space, then you're going to pull those things back into your workspace if you're yeah. always going like this. So that's why it's important to really just have a smooth, you know, sort of technique to whatever you're doing. Yeah, that does highlight the next thing of whenever you're working in here, right, we're bringing up turbulence, air turbulence, so you're not going to be like... Yeah. You're as you're working inside your of the flow head, yeah. right? That's going to be it's <laughs> slow, in control, we're not shaking yeah. shit around and whatever. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, but I, yeah, I think that was also, it brings up, a, I don't know, my relation then would be how propane and stuff, it doesn't actually have a smell. We right. add in the rotten egg smell. To know. So again, yeah. just to that. And then also made me think, I've seen some people push smoke yeah. through and then they're able to see yeah. how the air does come out of their filter. So yeah. could also be something to do if you're just curious kind of how these Don't do that current. to your filters per se. <laughs> What's the old like uh, Garrick's farm technique? Just you want to know how many uh, 
You want to know how, if you have good air exchange, just rip a butt inside of a fruit room and you shouldn't see the smoke. You know? There you go. Which is hilarious. <laughs> I wouldn't advise that at oh. all. But, uh, <laughs> then again. Science. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Cool. I think uh, something to test before, because we don't have this guy wired up. This is more of an example. And for the record, we're not operating these in this open warehouse, dirty environment. These are just like extra things we've been working on or have. Yeah. Um, and we've been giving away these small little nomad lights from uh, Lab Rat Flow Hoods. Um, this guy is there. This is like, this is a great scale example of kind of depending upon what you need. Um, you can pick a 2x4 Flow Hood or a 4x8 or this tiny fucking like 8.5x11 sheet Flow Hood. But I am curious because I've never measured it. And what these are are essentially just like 3D printed in casings with like a computer fan in the back. Um, they do have mounts if you wanted to throw in like a pre-filter, but generally speaking, I don't think, yeah, these are, I mean, it says 99.99 or 0.1 micron. Yeah, um, you can get a HEPA filter in most yeah, sizes. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So these are cool. I don't know where that other piece went. That was, uh, part of it. Outlets. Did they, yeah. Did they not work? I wonder. I don't know. Let's find out. Fuck yeah. It there works. That's good oh, to know. Oh, <laughs> man, that's pretty... All right, yeah, yeah, it's got some pull. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know what these actually push, because I've never never even thought about it, to be honest. So right up almost on the filter, we got like 98, yeah, 102. Yeah, that's great. This thing's fucking dialed in. Good job, <laughs> Nomad. Yeah, so if we pull away, let's say like a Petri dish space away... We're right in that range, still 102. Pull out a little bit further. Ninety-six. I think towards the edge, same thing, 104. 96. So, you know, not to sort of like go crazy with each of the different filters, but it's amazing how they all sort of have their own uh, fluctuations from side to side. And it's nothing to get like crazy paranoid about, especially because I'm creating a lot of, you know, movement here. But you're really shooting for that like 90 range. Mm -hmm. If it's a little higher, the closer you get to it, it's totally fine. Um, but and I have noticed where it's like the middle of the filter where that fan is, you'll see like lower, you know, uh, feet per second or whatever. Yeah, and obviously something like this you'll only want to be working in the middle of your... Yeah. You don't want to be working on your outskirts, so to say. No. So really when we're thinking about this, we are just thinking... Yeah, kind just of in that region. filter region. Yeah. yeah. And all this is is a simplified version of this where you just have this 3D printed fan in the back mm -hmm. and uh, and they'll I can turn it on, get it ripping, let's see if it works. Bam. Can't really <laughs> tell, but... Uh, but yeah, it's it's just pulling in air from the back. There's probably the HEPA filter is probably making up one third of the front of this. Yeah, so and I imagine void. it's blower in most of this. Yeah, um, I don't know if they have a pre-filter no, in the back. So. I don't imagine, but I mean, you could even just toss on like a filter paper over that, and you could probably get away with using that as a, a pre-filter. Yeah, what's funny is there's actually a grid in there. Mm -hmm. It's like it almost looks like uh, perforated eighth-inch circles. So yeah, almost like a yeah, grid. Yeah, yeah. So the grid on the other side allows this fan to push against and then evenly distribute across the filter. Um, some of them are on these as well. It almost looks like that grid on top of uh, on top yeah, of the filter yeah, that in the back. circle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's yeah. in there. So it makes a ton of sense for even distribution across the filter. And this guy doesn't really have, it's got a net in front of the filter, but it's nothing like substantial, right? So it's just kind of glued into place. Um, so you don't always need like two layers of mesh filtration. This is obviously a really nice barrier um, for working. So what is this? Right, above and beyond <laughs> the make it work. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, so 100 bucks. These guys make fucking units now that are like, I think they're their biggest units, maybe two by three. Um, they're talking about making bigger ones, but the reality is, is you can build one of these units. Um, 
And just to quickly touch on it, I don't really emphasize that many people try and build their own flow hood initially, even if they're like, I have the best carpentry skills in the world. I am the master of wood butchering. <laughs> I just don't advise it. Like it's a, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work to get these things to like fit in right. But there's more and more companies who are just looking at this stuff advantageously and being like, we can Probably just 3D print it. this shit. Yeah. yeah. I think also then, you know, if you build something your own, you're going to have attachment to it. Yeah. So that you're never going to look at that as being the problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people, room. yeah, a lot of people get into that little mindset. Um, yeah. So it just kind of helps avoid those. Yeah. Usually these are pre-tested, pre-treated, and I'm sure most companies, if you, yeah. hey, it's blowing off, or, yeah. you know, maybe you do an example, and hey, this agar plate got contaminated, and I'm sure they'd be open to have a conversation. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I know that, yeah. like, this one came dented, so we never used it, right? And <laughs> I was like, all right, they just sent us another one. Um, yeah, see, so even, even that... Yeah, really so nice, yeah. that's worth pointing out. Our three sort of main sources for these filters is, uh, I think this is International Filter Sales. Is that what it is? Might um, be on there. Um, it doesn't say. Oh, is it Flow Hoods International? Uh, LFCR, yes. Most places that are finding these FFU units, they're getting them through these guys. So I think filtersales.com. Um, there's another company, I think it's called like Flow Cube. It's this filter. They're all marking them up. If you go to the source, you can get these for like 850 bucks a piece. Um, the filter replacement units, which are pretty easy to replace, are, you know, maybe 300, 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's worth keeping them and replacing them and upkeeping them. Whereas something like this, um, I think is kind of on the verge of making a dent in that environment because people are understanding exactly how they're made and there's more of a market for it now. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really a market for these outside of like, you know, a standard lab <laughs> for over Yeah, I mean, in our application, it's our clean room, yeah. pre-filters pre or the help of filters yeah. for the clean rooms and then just our workspace inside of the clean rooms. Yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe that's something to touch on kind of applications for... Yeah, so Each traditionally these, yeah. these are not used, right, for flow hoods. Um, no. We've got it propped up right now on a piece of uh, just board, right? But mm -hmm. a, a three-quarter inch uh, piece of Trex decking can be used to get these to sit on a table. And then they do have mounting tabs in the back. So yeah. you can make one of these out of these units. Um, but they're sort of built to fit into a wall cavity. Yeah, so what these do is they have a six inch, I think it's like five and a half or six inch um, uh, space in which you can fit it into the framing of most walls that are two by sixes. Um, makes it really easy to mount into a wall and pull air from the back, so from a different space, plenum. through the filter, create positive pressure in that room, then have it return to the plenum or mm -hmm. whatever space you're sort of conditioning. Um, so it really helps. These ones don't yeah. give you that opportunity. These, like, usually these two things are in tandem. You'll have one of these in a wall blowing into your lab from somewhere else. And what that's doing is creating positive pressure in a room. And the pre-filter on this unit, pulling from a dirty area, will have to be replaced much more consistently than a pre-filter on one of these, mm -hmm. so long as that's in the room as well. Yeah, I think uh, these are three to four months that we usually do, yeah. sometimes even half a year because we check them and there's Nothing not much, so them. it's not worth it. And then every week for <laughs> yeah, these for ones, especially since, like you mentioned, these are going to be shooting into your clean room from a presumably yeah. dirty space. Yep. So these are kind of the heroes of your clean room and your setup. And oh, yeah. I think that was important to mention <clears throat> that with a couple of these units, you can create that overpressure that's needed to move air through the clean room yeah. where you can't really, I guess, buy 10 flow hoods right. and maybe you could get the same effect, but... Maybe. Right, right. it was very different applications. <laughs> and then I guess another thing just building on that would be this is mainly for culture work for us and yeah. the very early stage of stuff because, right, if we mess up there down the line, we've just destroyed so much more. Yeah. So we always do stuff in the industrial $10,000 safe zone. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. to say, whereas when we go into our more like spawning ideas, 
then we can open up to a HEPA, f I mean, we're already in the clean room, which is HEPA filtered by these. And then again, we're in front of another set of these units yeah. to do the actual spawning. So we're actually getting double the HEPA filtration. Yeah. So, I mean, right, I guess we're doing that with this as well, yeah. but it's just, you can get a little larger scale with this and you can actually have your setup. Yeah. Um, I think again, it's kind of the same if you're doing it from that close up distance. It's about that same workspace as in the flow hood, mm -hmm. or at least that I've seen on the farm. I don't know if it does extend out a little farther with these we units. Had, it's but. funny over time, like that we figured this stuff out. Like 10 years ago, we had, we're like, let's get the 36 inch table, 48 inch table, <laughs> and just fucking layer it with bags, you know? There was some character, I forget uh, who it was, but he had this like beautiful wall of flow hoods. Mm -hmm. And he had this huge table and had like maybe 400 bags that he would like had opened and spawned all at the same time. <laughs> right. Yeah, what are his numbers? <laughs> but right, but that was us being like, that's killer because uh -huh. it's production numbers. Mm -hmm. And you're like, if you can open that many more bags, awesome. But in all reality, because you're trying to like contain and uh, retain that 90 feet per minute um, uh, measurement, you don't want to go too far from that distance because you know it gets to 60 out here and it's going to come out of here at like 120. Yes. So here when you're pouring, particles yeah. are getting removed, 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 and then now, now it's just maybe they're just fall. falling right. Yeah. And you have something in the way. So mm -hmm. I don't suggest going any more um, deep than a bag length, especially if you're working outside of here. So mm -hmm. if you use a 36 inch table and those take up 12 inches, you have, you know, 18 and change left. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're always it. right up on the filter. Yeah. Same with culture work, right up next to the filter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that that's the most important um, thing to figure out with these flow hoods is just table depth. It's it's uh, and it also points out to these ones have this this sort of uptick grid here um, that keeps the people working away from it. So even if you manage to hit this. I'm still, you know, probably a quarter to a half inch away from that filter, um, separated by another mesh grid. What we do for these guys in the flow hood, um, or in the um, substrate lab, is we literally just take a piece of stainless steel angle iron and we'll put it right in front of the filter base and just run it the whole length. So as, you know, uh, people in the lab are putting blocks up to the filter, they can get it as close as possible without actually hitting the filter. Um, you're hiring people that once again like you pointed out they don't have experience with these tools they don't know like what mm -hmm. is this filter made out of yeah there's, kevlar there's get paid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 exactly so uh, in order to like set people up for success it's important to sort of like look at the instruments you're using and and help preserve them the best way you can mm -hmm. and um I guess another thing to mention there, when you are pouring the bags, if yeah. you ever have some missed grain, instead of it bouncing and then shooting into your filter, the possibility of these grids and this little anger angle iron allows for stuff to kind of hit it, go up against it. You don't have to worry about it falling down yeah. into your flow hood or anything like that. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. Okay, so then how to check a flow hood? Yeah, and yeah. Just regular. Oh, I guess we didn't talk about this guy's application. Yeah, this guy's amazing. Just mm -hmm. for like, I don't know, you're a first time culture work person. Yeah, I mean, just a regular little office space with a closed door. I think he said um, about 20 to 30 minutes running this, and it yeah. should have your filtered airspace. Yeah. So this is great for kind of the at home yeah. starter, very easy to set up plug and play or yeah. keep saying that plug it in uh, it's literally it, plug and play though yeah you don't yeah. even need to wire this fucking thing i don't even know what the fans made out of i like would love to chat with these guys and go visit them and see what their setup is because nobody is doing it like them there's a lot of people fake doing it like them you know yeah but these cats are fucking on it so mm -hmm. and as we assess the airflow is good hepa filter is good yeah. i think even when we first got these i did just open up a culture in front of yeah. it and just let test. it run through, close yeah. it, and see what happens. It was perfectly fine. So yeah, yeah. even an initial 
trial period yeah. and passed. But if you're out in the field, like uh, I've seen uh, William, but he is the one I've seen use it for like demonstrations mostly. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of funny to see him working at this thing with an audience that way. And they're yeah, like, what they is can't he fucking see doing? <laughs> yeah. Some people crowd around and look, but mm-hmm. they're great for field flow hoods. Um, you can plug these into a cigarette lighter, uh, um, into like a, you know, a converter for your car. I was going to say, in your car it could yeah. even work and then you could get Alan Rockefeller and start right, doing your right. DNA extractions <laughs> in the car. Right, How yeah. nerdy do you want to get with your fucking oh, escape vehicle? Oh, I've thought about it too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's such a fucking handy tool, and people have been thinking about this stuff forever. But not enough people have put an emphasis on like how to make it scalable production wise and how yeah. to make it cheap enough. You know? And I think even in nature, it's applicable with that airflow. If you're working right here, where yeah. you just you know you have your dirty mushroom, you set this down on a rock or whatever, yeah. somewhat of a flat surface. You could have a plate right in front of it, closed. Get your piece that you want to inoculate it with. Yeah. Do your quick transfer, parafilm up, and yeah. once your parafilm's on, now you're good to go. Yeah, yeah and yeah. so you could even just bring, you know, probably like a little, a little stack phone charger fucking... these days. The portable chargers yeah. probably have an outlet for that, and yep. then you could get away with, yeah, capturing your genetic samples yeah. out in the field like that. I thought mm-hmm. it would be hilarious to take one of these on a fucking airplane and just like do some transfers. Like, uh, oh, in um, midair. So my can... first boss, Anaerobe at Anaerobe Express, he made yeah. the anaerobic chambers. Really? Yeah, he's a <laughs> patent designer for those. No uh, way. So when he was first designing these, he used to travel on airplanes and stuff <laughs> with like a little anaerobic chamber in his suitcase with these no cultures way. and just be like, don't ask, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. funny, man. I mean, that's how we smuggle <laughs> cultures back from fucking Europe. And exactly, stuff, yeah. Right? So, <laughs> I think you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or I guess you can even open it up on the plane. You could do culture work. Well, they have right these plugs in the seat, exactly. dude. <laughs> so you could just fucking plug it in. All right. Bust out your little pre-wrapped fucking. Uh, oh, the next cultures. time I'm on a flight, I think that's what I'm gonna do. It? Yeah, <laughs> bring out little bag of mushrooms and <laughs> cut them and sample oh, them. Oh man, dude, that plane would land. That plane would land so fast. It would be oh, kind of funny. Be so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, now you have to try that. All right, so but, yeah. away from, uh, or getting away from the CFM stuff in general um, mm-hmm. and, and testing flow, if you have that correct, if you really want to know if you've, like, you know, hit your filter by accident or it's a questionable filter, you just want to test its age, the best way to do that is by plate testing. So this thing in particular is just a blank, neutrified agar dish, pre-poured, filtered, whatever, huh? MYA. It's yeah, okay, mall yeast extract. I think tip of the cap, yeah, he sterilized uh, autoclave sterilization. I mean, oh yeah. Of course. If you need uh, cultures, tip of the cap. And by Micropose, they're yeah. partnered together. Yeah, Micropose is actually making the fucking dishes, getting them made in China, mm-hmm. um, or Japan, or wherever the fuck. So these things are kind of uh, great biological testers. And what we do usually to test the filter is just let this thing run for as long as it needs to, if it hasn't been turned on in a while, um, and get air sort of cleaning the areas around it. And then you're just gonna wanna take a bunch of these, you know, pre-nutrified agar dishes, open them up and just hold them up to an area in the filter that's either questionable, or you can just let them sit on the table for what, 15, 20 minutes? Yeah. At the most. And I guess if you're overly curious, you know, you could just do, okay, so it's not on right now, so this plate probably will get contaminated. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> just a heads up. So yeah, you could even, you know, kind of do a very slow, tests like this if you wanted to test each filter and spots but i think that was a good point say you like bash up on one spot yeah then I, like, that would oh, definitely be a, okay i'm just gonna hold this here for right. maybe a minute yeah i think that'd be a good enough time just to kind of let it cycle through yep. and then so i did test this flow hood to prove its viability and as eric said i got a whole bunch of the plates and we were doing other stuff so i just turned it on let it run for about 20 minutes and then I got six plates and then I just positioned them, you know, corner, center, corner, corner, center, corner, mm-hmm. opened up all the plates while it's running and on. And I just let them sit there for about three, four hours, yep. come back, seal them all up and then just wait and see if there's any growth. Yeah. And the main thing that I'd be worried about would be growth on the middle of the plates. I was just out 
here in this big dirty space so i was touching it with open hands not gloves so mm -hmm. if there was you know something growing on the very edge yeah I'd be, okay that was me and nothing ever appeared on the edges or in the middle of the plates and so that shows to me with three hours of it being on pushing through that filter nothing got on my plates inside of the work area and they weren't right up against it they were probably about where i would be working along the flow hood and that to me lets me know cool i just proved culture work can happen mm -hmm. and that's just a nice easy way of testing your flow hood yeah i've seen uh mycelia did this to a pretty extensive degree um, and you can make maps of your facility. So say you're using one of these as your overpressure units. You have this running in one area, but you're like, what's happening over in the other side of the room? You can just open up a dish and you're all Tyvek'd up and suited and just leave it open for a couple hours in one area. Come back a little bit later and then, you know, wrap it up mm -hmm. and leave it for a couple weeks and see what grows. If nothing grows on there to any degree, you got a really, really clean environment. Yeah. Um, so be proud of yourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we do in our lab. Yeah, we Every just make maps of places. Six tests. months or so inside of, you know, in between each doorway, we have our yep. vents. So in each vent in front of every HEPA unit. I guess we do have HEPA units that are stacked on top of each other. Yep. So don't know if we've ever gone up there but we put agar plates in other corners of the room and they've proven good as well so yeah and kind of proof of theory as well yeah i mean luckily you're creating enough positive pressure in there that using a manometer you can tell it's all going to go out one directional area which are those little dog doors we have in our labs mm -hmm. so if you put a plate right there you're literally capturing, capturing everything. everything that would go through that room mm -hmm. And that's a great way to test. Um, and I would test it when you're not working. Yeah. Because yeah. even if you're Tyvek and everything, and if everything's getting pushed through that hole and going through there, yeah. you're maybe just inviting it yourself mm -hmm. instead of proving the efficiency of your filters. Yeah. So it would be a maybe when nothing's that much is going on in the lab type yeah. of testing to do if you wanted true understanding of your filters instead of getting it skewed by human interaction as well so to say for sure yeah um yeah another thing to mention just in filter care and upkeep in this is i don't know how many times in the past decade i've heard people conflicting you know conversations about spraying filters directly with isopropyl <laughs> right you and i are like are you fucking kidding me but last there are michael people, wizard's video <laughs> right? yeah. yeah there are people who literally like you can spray right into a filter it's fine you know and you're like you're weakening a membrane by doing yeah. that. So when you, you open up something with water and its pores sort of swell and open up, it will then pull things in, mm -hmm. in either direction. So you're weakening the filter, first of all. Um, and second of all, there's no need to create like resistance or uh, more waterlogged or um, sort of dead spots within a filter. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of filter upkeep and you know uh, protocols that should be kept in place to know that this is like, this is Valhalla, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, it's there, but don't go near it until yeah, the time is ready. Yeah, I guess that's you know? always just kind of <laughs> sideways or a little angled towards. Yeah. And then also, yeah, right, it's just kind of a big paper matrix. So yeah. if you're inviting that alcohol group in there, it might just react with some of that cellulose right. or anything that's going on inside. Yeah. And then you're just damaging the filters where it's no longer able to even capture particles. Yeah, and sure. again, opening up a channel with that water so yeah. say something like a sport does land yeah it's right, right on through, through. yep mm -hmm. and also moisture and uh <laughs> mushroom mycelium or spores they don't need much food right yeah <laughs> so like especially for something like neurospora if you have some neurospora in your facility and it gets pulled through a filter and it's wet it will harbor itself there and grow mm -hmm. it doesn't give a fuck man i've seen that shit grow on like I don't know, only carbon, you know, like materials. Yeah, and we don't use 100% alcohol anywhere, yeah. so technically you're always going to have some water logging if yeah. that does occur. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're just like trapping and pushing through contaminants. Yeah, so don't spray your fucking flow hoods or filters, yeah. please. Yeah, that, that's for all of them. Yeah. It's not just yeah, the yeah, big yeah. flow hood, that's just across the board. Yeah, general. and that's why yeah. these are nice. They, I don't know where that case went or cover for it, but these 3D printed units basically have a frame that goes around them for when you're working. And then um, you can spray this down with alcohol, clean it off, and this just goes on there to cover it while you're traveling or whatever. It can also be used as a uh, workspace. 
which is kind of fucking rad. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that also, yeah, a little on. wire rack would yeah. be very beneficial as well. Yeah, 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 for sure. But yeah, do whatever you can to take care of the the filters, especially if you're traveling with them or whatever. Um, yeah. And I guess yeah, in my two and a half years now being here, we've never replaced a HEPA filter. Mm -mm. I don't know if we've ever at Gardner. Only when we have to build something or we get a or it gets up dented one. or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yep. just goes to you know take proper care, yeah. treat these with respect, and they're gonna respect you. Yep. It almost kind of proves that investment of yeah. the eight hundred dollars. If you get a decade out of it, yeah. eighty dollars a year for a filtered clean room is it's less kind of a nice bargain. Cent a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't do that math, but seriously, yeah, mm -hmm. like paying eight hundred fifty bucks for a yeah eighteen few... cents a day. So I'm kidding. Okay, <laughs> yeah, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I didn't go to math school, Gregor. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can afford these things and they're very important compared to contamination which is so fucking expensive and it, it's amazing how many people just suffer with like one particular metric in mind and they're like our contamination rate is 25 percent, and it will just always be there and then they just suffer yeah. you're like what are you doing man <sighs> you can get these contamination rates under control if you mm -hmm. just carefully analyze where the things are coming from whether it's your technique or your filter or whatever it is, you can test them, you can know mm -hmm. how they work best, and you can preserve their, you know, um, effective nature. Yeah. So, yeah, these are the start of it all. Yeah, so you got three choices, man. A couple hundred bucks, 800 bucks, under a thousand. Yeah, what's your scale? 10,000, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you pick. But uh, I think these things are rad. I know some people are importing them who will not be mentioned, um, <laughs> but they're like 1,200 to 1,400 bucks. Just go to the fucking source, man. You know, like, those units are subpar compared to what are manufactured and tested in the United States to a degree. Um, not all these units are, but, uh, yeah, I think it's it's important to make sure that you're buying a quality filter. So yeah. I can only speak for these three companies. I don't know. We don't use any other ones. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's filters and flow hoods for you. Um if you got questions, call Tyler at 1-800. No. <laughs> Happy days.